Hey, and welcome to the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast. I'm Serena Shoup, CPA, a mom of three, and I've been running a virtual bookkeeping business from my home since 2017. You are in the right place if you are a bookkeeper, accountant, or an accounting student, and you believe and know in your heart that your purpose is bigger than sitting in a cubicle. If you're ready to learn some actionable tips and strategies for starting and growing your accounting business, then I hope you stick around. Welcome back to the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast. Today, I have a special guest named Jules White to talk to us about SEO. So it's been quite a while since I've touched on this subject on my podcast. So I'm really excited to dive in and talk about how things currently are and whatnot. So would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you. It's so lovely to be here. So yeah, I'm so I'm Jules White. I'm a web and SEO consultant. So I help course creators and local businesses to get more traffic and sales through their website using SEO. And it just means that they can rely less on social media and paid ads by doing that really. So my background is as a beauty and holistic therapist, but I've always been a geek and in, always been involved in marketing. And so yeah, that's why I've ended up down the SEO route of yeah, just the, the full geekiness embraced there really. Awesome. I think what would be really valuable because most of my audience are bookkeepers, a lot of them are virtual. And so we're serving like myself, I serve course creators as well across the US. So there are certain things that I think we can touch on for the bookkeepers who serve local clients and the ones that are like me and serve people all over the place. So let's start with the local businesses. What are some of the key things that you end up consulting on when you have a local business trying to get traffic to their website? So yeah, this is also relevant for my business as well, because <laughs> I ser- I have a lot of local clients. I do a lot of local networking, but also can, can serve people anywhere. So yeah, the big thing, and this is one of my big passions is for local businesses is Google Business Profile. It's a lot easier for local businesses to show up and to use SEO. And having that Google Business Profile is one of the most powerful things that people can do in their, in their local businesses to collect, connect with people locally through search. And it's one of the ones that's really easy to do and often overlooked as well. So if people are posting on social media, even just something as simple as adding posts to their Google business profile or even going and claiming the Google profile, often people haven't done that. There's so much that we can do to optimize our profiles and just doing that can make a massive difference really because the posts on there stay relevant and stay up for so much longer than what we all know with social media it just disappears straight away doesn't it with a google business profile you can post on there and you can post updates about your business it would be more sort of business related stuff rather than you know where we would post sort of personal stuff maybe on our even on our business pro business social media profiles but those posts can be really helpful and really valuable and so that people who are local to you can understand about what you're doing really and and can find you on Google. And it helps you to actually connect with people when they're searching for what you do. That's the the big benefit of SEO is people are actually looking for help with a problem that you can solve rather than just trying to interrupt the scroll on social media and and try and just capture their attention. Whereas actually they're, they're looking for something and we can be there as that solution on the search results pages. I completely agree with that. A lot of bookkeepers, I think we overlook the power of SEO in that regard. And it's like, I'm not getting any clients and they're just kind of focused on posting on social media. But yeah, you've got to go to where the people are actually looking and that's Google, (laughs) you know? I see it time and time again in people, when I look at people's Google Analytics, that the traffic that comes through Google stays on your website for longer is more likely to convert because as I say, you're capture, capturing them at the moment they're actually searching for services. So. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you recommend for those of us who are more virtual or we work from home? How does that work with Google My Business? Do you have to have a physical location? We have to be a little bit creative with it. So with Google Business Profiles, they essentially say that you, you need to have face-to-face or you need to have customer what's the word so yeah contact face face-to-face contact with your customers but i have a google business profile and i i do have face-to-face contact with my customers but it's over zoom so if you are purely e-commerce and you're just selling e-commerce you know you're just an e-commerce business then yes you can't have a google business profile but otherwise you can be a service area business so you don't have to have a pin in the map and if you don't have a, a 
physical location that clients can come and see you at. So if you don't actually have an office where clients can come and visit you, then we don't actually recommend you shouldn't have a pin in, in the map. It's against Google's guidelines. We do see a lot of businesses that still have that. We see a lot of plumbers and locksmiths and all sorts of industries where they have a pin in the map and really they shouldn't because they go out and they, they go to their customers. But if you want to do it and actually follow Google's guidelines, then you would set it as a service area business. But I would actually recommend still focusing on local because the Google business profile, so I'm in the southern part of the UK, but I'm not going to show up in Scotland for my Google business profile, but I will show up locally. So I would still say, even if you are a business where you can work with somebody anywhere, then still focus on your local area in terms of your Google business profile, really, rather than setting it's the whole country wide, because you're not going to show up on the other side of the country for, for your Google profiles. Oh, that's really helpful. I think near the beginning of my business, I tried to kind of set up my Google business profile and I got stuck in that area of like trying to figure like they couldn't verify my address or something like that. Maybe because I was using like a UPS store box or some PO box or something like that. And it was like there was too many businesses registered at that address. <laughs> yeah, that is actually against Google's guidelines. You're not allowed to use the PO box. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, it's funny because somebody, one a, a friend of ours had been advised by somebody to move his pin from his local area to a PO box. And I, luckily I caught, I had a conversation with him before he did it because otherwise he had loads of reviews and all those kind of things. And actually, if you kind of do something like that, where Google is then gets its Google's eye on you almost, that can then get your profile suspended. And then you have to go through all that hassle of actually getting it verified and getting it re-verified, which they've made a lot more difficult now. You, you usually have to do it by video verification. So if somebody is a service area business, then I've had a few clients where what they've had to do is actually log into the back end of their website and show, show that as part of the video. So it, you're basically just showing Google that you are this business and that you're legitimate. So they've had to do that and they've managed to then get verified. But it is more tricky now. It's not a case of just getting a postcard. We used to just be able to get a postcard through the mail mm -hmm. and be able to verify, but it is more tricky now. Yeah. Okay, good. Let's step back a little bit and kind of talk about what SEO is and why it's important. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we skipped that one. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so SE SEO stands for search engine optimization. And essentially what it means is that we're arranging the information on our website in a way that search, it, search engines like Google and Yahoo and Bing can understand. And the reason that we focus on Google is because the majority of searches that are done through a search engine are done on Google. So that's why we still focus on Google. There's lots of rumors about Google dying and Google being dead. But realistically, even now, even though they have dropped some of their market share, still the, the figures are still showing that sort of 80 percent of searches are still done through Google. So that's why. And also, if you optimize for Google, you will show up on the other search engines as well. So, so SEO is, is essentially just making sure that your website is laid out in the way that Google can understand. Yeah. So does it matter what website platform or builder you're using? It doesn't. The actual platform doesn't matter. But sometimes the way that platforms are built can make a difference. So some platforms have very clunky code. And the big difference is, is if the platform is very slow to load. That's the big thing that can cause issues. But it doesn't really matter. Like WordPress is great because you have the flexibility to be able to do, do edits to the back end to try and get it as good as you can in terms of the page load speed and all the other stuff. But then a lot of people are terrified to, of breaking their WordPress website. So they never make any changes to their website. And then that's not good for your SEO. So there's no reason why a, plat a, a website built on any kind of platform shouldn't rank and shouldn't get traffic from Google. But there are certain things that you certainly can do to make sure, to give yourself the best chance, really. So everything being equal, if there are two websites that Google is undecided about which one has got the best results and essentially what Google wants to do is deliver the best results for its customers which are the people who are making the searches and if there's two there and one loads very quickly and one doesn't then Google's going to choose the one that loads quickly everything else being equal really okay and what are some of the other things that increase your chances of being up on the Google search engine so essentially what it is 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 having good content on your website so that's the most important thing is that actually what Google wants to deliver as I say, the best results for its customers. And so it's always worth thinking about the human search intent behind what you're trying to sort of focus on. So 
I, one of the big things that I see people doing is trying to rank all of their pages on the website for the same words or phrase. So we talk about keywords and key phrases. They're either trying to do that, so they're trying to get all of their pages to show up on the exact same phrases, which they, is the general phrase about their business, or they're trying to stuff all of their keywords. They're trying to get everything on one page. So that's sort of the main things is actually thinking about your website structure, thinking about how you can simplify your website structure and be really, what's the word, be really focused on which pages you want to try and show up for in it, which searches really. So it's always good to do a little bit of keyword research before you start thinking about your website and, and what you're doing with that. And then making sure that you are actually sort of focusing on those particular keywords really. So yeah. So you kind of talked about like relevant content. Is there a certain frequency that you should be updating your website? And what does constitute like a change or update on your website that Google favors? So in terms of what Google favors, we don't really know because Google doesn't tell us exactly why it would choose one particular piece of content over others. But I think if we're going in and making changes to our pages, it doesn't have to be a percentage of the page is the changes are made or, you know, it, it's really just a case of, of Google seeing that there are changes being made to these pages. And that can be as much as just releasing a blog post once a month, especially if you've got quite a lot of content already. We have this feeling of we've got to keep releasing content all the time. But Google and even more so now, Google really favours quality over quantity. So if you've got lots of old blog posts that you haven't been back to and optimised for a while, I would be thinking about doing that before just keep churning out new content, especially if you are using lots of AI content and not really editing it yourself. It's going to be much better to go through and actually edit those blog posts and get some more good quality content, really. That's a really good point. And also a relief because I blog about once a month on my firm website. We put out more blogs on the Ambitious Bookkeeper website because we do a weekly podcast. So we kind of repurpose that. But as far as my firm goes... Yeah, I blog about once a month, and that's sometimes inconsistent too. And I do use AI to get, create the bones of my blog post, but then I add to it, change the language and the voice and everything so it sounds like me, and I simplify things a little bit more. But yeah, that's refreshing to hear that I'm on the right track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think for service businesses, it's not necessarily always blog posts that we need to be creating. So it's, and especially as things are changing, the search results pages are, are literally changing day by day because of AI coming out and the search generative experience is this new thing that Google's rolling out. And we will see this, that the search results will change. So actually those informational type posts that we're doing where people are looking for information and Google then will deliver just one result at the top or you know will de deliver an AI type result that. That may then not result in people actually clicking through to your website. Whereas things like, for, especially for service businesses, things like case studies, if you can then find some commercial intent keywords. So there's when we when we think about keywords and we do keyword research, we always try and work out what people are actually looking for. When what what kind of results are they looking for when they're doing a search? So is it that they're looking to buy a service or are they just looking for information? And if we can really hone in on those commercial keywords where people are actually looking to help with, you know, looking for help with something, then actually creating case studies and things where we use those kind of keywords can be more powerful. So if you are a local business and you can do a case study and then include a local area in that, you could then create a new page around that that would then be much more likely to show up for people who are looking for your kind of services, really. Okay. Can you dive a little more into detail or specifically what that means to create a case study that references, is that what you're saying? You're creating a case study about a client in say the Houston area and you drop the keywords of Houston and maybe the industry of that client, right? Well, I would be thinking more so, so for bookkeepers, then but I would be maybe thinking about some the URL of something like bookkeeping client Houston or something along those lines, really. Obviously, diving in and, and working out what people are actually searching for is really important right. first. But it, it also does depend on what Google is showing on the search results page. So if Google is showing loads of blog posts, then actually a case study might not be the thing that does show up. Or if, if you type something into Google and Google is showing loads of products there, then your blog is probably unlikely to show up on that search because Google knows that people are searching for information about that really. Okay. So, but yeah, it would be thinking, it's just one one kind of creative way of you, how you can think about 
if you want to show up locally, what else can I do using local keywords and use that within, which, and only if it's relevant, obviously if it's not relevant, then Google won't show that page up because Google will work out that actually this isn't relevant. You can stuff all the keywords in there. And years ago, that's what we used to do, but then that's not going to work now. Google's algorithms are too smart and the bots that go out and read all the pages are too smart to be fooled like that. Yeah. So yeah, it, it can be a powerful way to get that information across. In, in ways that are aside from just writing blog posts. And that's not to say that blog posts aren't great, but it's also thinking about, okay, if I've got a blog post, how can I then align this with where people are actually searching for, for services like mine? Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, you've got my wheels turning. <laughs> Ideas. <laughs> uh, yeah. Awesome. Okay. So when we're talking about keywords, is there, I can see this being an area where this might overwhelm people. So when you start talking about like, okay, doing your keyword research and how to kind of navigate that without feeling overwhelmed and... Yeah, I think it can feel really overwhelming and it can feel technical as well. Like people, so many people have heard of keywords, but then actually trying to get from knowing that, okay, I need to optimize for keywords and then knowing which ones to do is, can often be tricky. What I tend to say to my clients is we focus first on what are the core topics that you need to cover in your business. So if you can narrow it down to three to five areas that your business, you need to be talking about, you need Google and you need people to understand about your business and what you do. So whether that is bookkeeping, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a copywriter. So yeah. I'm thinking of ideas off the top of my head, but like bookkeeping would be one. You mm-hmm. need to talk about bookkeeping. Yeah. You need to make like, so I don't know whether like accountancy, whether that would be part of it and, you know, financial management or something. Oh, that's the kind mm-hmm. of thinking of three terms and make sure that you've covered those well. So uh, that would be something I would say first and foremost, make sure you've got some articles or some information. And that could even be a sales page or a services page that talks about that that particular term. And you're probably not going to be showing up on Google unless it's a very local search. You're probably not going to be showing up on Google for the term accountant. You may do, as I say, if it's very local, but it's a, it's a that's a very broad keyword. But having that information there then lets Google know that everything else you talk about around that topic, you do know what you're talking about because you're, you've already got that relevant mm-hmm. content on your website. Way to sort of explain this is if i've got a client who's a dog walker and i always we've got a dog i always come back to dogs and cats but with a dog walker if a dog walker's got lots of information on their website about dogs and then they start writing an article about rabbits then google's less likely to rank that new article than they would about another article about dogs so essentially google already knows you're an authority on that topic then what you can then do is go into google literally a google search and type in that seed keyword. So type in the word accountant and see what is coming up. See what questions are coming up on there. There's a few good tools that you can use for keyword research, but one that's really good is called Keywords Everywhere, which is a Google Chrome plugin. And I think it's something like $15 for 100,000 searches, which would last would easily last you a year. And that will then give you some ideas for what we call long tail keywords. And Long tail keywords are those longer phrases. So with all keywords, we tend to be thinking about key phrases really because it's much easier to rank for. So these long tail ones are where they're three plus words, usually a question or a sentence. And if we can find out that there are some of those that have got a lot of people searching for them each month, but then not got a lot of competition, there's not that much content out there. That's when you would then write articles that support your main article about accountancy. So Google know, already knows that you talk about accountancy and that you're trustworthy on that subject. And then you can create those supporting articles. So that's where I would kind of start with keyword research is thinking, first and foremost, what topics am I covering? Have I covered that basic topic, even if I'm not actually going to rank for that term? And then how can I find some more phrases that people are searching for? around that topic, around sort of related things, really. Okay, that's really helpful. How do you know how many times or how much people are searching for something? Yeah, so that's where you, there's a few different tools that you can use. So there is the Keywords Everywhere plugin that will show you that information. It will also tell you if it's a brand related query as well. So it will tell you whether you've got a chance of ranking for it, basically. And then there's a few other tools. There's one called KW Finder, that's it which is one that I quite like that one. I've got other tools that I use, sort of paid tools, but this is one where you can get, I think it's three searches a day for free and then you can sign up for a paid account if you want. But what I like about this one is it shows you the difficulty as well. So it gives you an idea on 
it, not only how many people are searching for it, like whether there are people searching for it, and what's the word on it, for how many searches there are a month, and whether it's too difficult to um, rank for. So it will give you a difficulty score so that you can then understand whether it's worth going after or something like that. And it, I'd be looking on there, anything around you know 35 and under, then you could maybe look at that as an option really. So I like it because it's very brightly coloured and you can see very clearly the information, which I think a lot of these tools are just like, way too overwhelming. And yeah. But yeah, you can go into that and type a seed keyword in and it will give you other ideas as well around that. When we're talking about SEO, that this all can apply to if you're creating YouTube content, the same like keyword searches, content, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So it is slightly different with YouTube, and there are other tools. I don't, I don't really do a lot around YouTube SEO, but there are other tools. I think there's one called TubeBuddy, which you can use those to look for keywords specifically related to YouTube. But yeah, YouTube is an interesting one actually because obviously it's owned by Google as well, and behind Google and Facebook, I think that's the next most searched is YouTube. So it's certainly worth optimizing your content on YouTube, right, with your your descriptions and things, your, your video descriptions on there. So it's certainly worth thinking about that. But it's slightly different with YouTube because YouTube's algorithm wants to keep people on YouTube, whereas Google, certainly at the moment, and again, that might change with the search generatively, the AI content that's coming out. But the idea with Google is that it then gets you off of that and onto whatever you're searching for, really, whereas YouTube very much wants you to stay on the platform. Awesome. This is all really, really helpful. So if someone has finally built their website, maybe they're kind of brand new to starting their business, what would you say their first step would be when it comes to setting all of this up for success? So I think the first step is working out those core topics. So working out what content you need to add to your website in the term, you know, in the form of, let's say, blog posts or case studies, or even just with your basic pages, with your basic navigation pages, like your home page. Probably something good to mention, actually, is that Google has certain pages it looks for to show that a business is trustworthy and is a, is a genuine business. So make sure that you have got a home page, an about page, and a contact us page, and ideally a privacy policy and other, those other kind of legal pages on your website as well, because that will all help Google to understand that you are legitimate. I would also then try and keep the same description across your bios across the internet. So you start building up this presence online. So if you are using social media, making sure that you've got a similar sort of bio. If you do have a pin in the map, making sure you've got that location on your website footer as well as other places as well. Setting up a Google profile if you can, if you're able to, then setting that up as well can be really helpful because you can then link your social media profile and your, your website to there. So Google then starts understanding that this is the same business. So yeah, I would start with that. I would then make sure that you work out what you want each page to try and rank for. So don't try and have everything, as I say, ranking for one particular term. So if you're wanting every page on your website to show up for your business name bookkeep and bookkeeping, then Google doesn't know which of those pages is the best one to show up for that search. So making sure you, you're mm. sort of clear on that, have a little Google sheet or something where you keep track of what you're trying to go after, what you're trying to rank those pages for. And you will start to show up for different search terms as well. So it's not like you're only going to rank for those things. But over time, it just helps you to have some focus. And then there's certain places in your page where you need to put those keywords. So once you've worked out, okay, I want to rank for this particular keyword, making sure that you have it ideally in the URL if you can. If it's something like a blog post or a services page or something like that, then having that keyword in your URL. So that could be bookkeeping and then your location. And you'd, write, you'd create a page around that. That can be really powerful, but we can't always do that with obviously our home page or our about page. But yeah, making sure that you use that. And then in the page title, and most modern website builders will have this built into them. So the page title, have your keyword in there. The page description as well. So having it in there, and this is the part of Google's page where we, where it kind of entices people to click through to our page. So it's good to have your keyword in there, but have it very natural so that people know that that's why they want to click through to our pages. And then ideally, we need to then have our page hierarchy laid out. So if you think about when we were back at school and writing English essays, we would only have one title. So we would have one heading and then we'd have subheadings within that. And we want our web pages to be lined up or laid out like that as well. And that's one of the common things that I see with the majority of clients who come to me. They haven't got this bit quite right because the website builders 
kind of encourage us to, to do this wrong because they're designed to make us think about that from a design point of view. So we use those H1, H2 headings, which you'll see in a website builder to make the page look pretty and make certain words bigger and certain words smaller. And actually what Google wants to see is that back end structure of the website. So if that makes sense, you should only have one H1 heading on each page and that should contain your keywords. And then from there in, you should then have within what, if there's subtopics within that page, then that would be your H2 headings. And then, so you should never have a H1 heading and then a H3 or a H4 or, you know, does that make sense of actually that, that structured page hierarchy and structure? Yeah, it does to me. It does. <laughs> yeah, I think it's something that is easier to show visually. But actually, once you kind of get that in your mind, then it does make sense because this is all about accessibility as well. So if somebody's reading a screen reader, then that helps them or if somebody's using a screen reader rather, somebody's visually impaired or, something, or for whatever reason they're using a screen reader, it helps them as well. And Google likes an accessible website. Too. That's so important to think about for sure. Okay. <laughs> This has been like a SEO masterclass. Hopefully it's not too much information or too overwhelming. Those are the most important places on your page. You'd also want to use it in image alt text as well. So in your website builder, you'll probably see if you add an image in, there will be a little box that says alt text. And if you can have your keyword in there, and that's why it, where it's good to, when you're thinking about images for your page, think about images that make sense for that keyword that you're trying to rank for. So say for example you were a salon and you were talking about facials having a picture of a back massage next to that particular piece of text doesn't make sense and so that's where actually having images that support what you're talking about with the, the copy on your page can be really powerful as well yeah i never really considered that i mean intuitively yes but not the reasoning behind it so thank you yeah and it's not easy like finding images for our websites is not easy. None of website stuff when you're doing it for yourself is easy, really. Writing the copy, finding the images, it's, it all is, it all takes time and, it, and it's hard. So I think actually thinking about it from that point of view, thinking what is, what is that, what am I tr talking about in this section and what image would support that is quite a good way to go about it, really. Whereas often we think, what images have I got and where can I fit them in? <laughs> Yeah, when it comes to images, this is another area that you have to be careful about, right? So either A, hire a brand photographer and get your own images created that are relevant to the content that you're going to be creating, or B, you have to pay for stock images. <laughs> you can't just Google images and rip them off the internet. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really important, actually. Yeah, yeah, you do need to use images. And there are, there are lots of free stock images out there as well. But Google, again, is less keen on that because Google is smart enough to read images. So if you are going to use stock images, I would definitely be thinking, yeah, make sure obviously they're ones that are free to, for commercial use. And even if you're using something like Canva, then there's plenty of images on there. But if you can just think of some way that you can then make those images, just change them slightly so they're a bit more brand relevant. And even if that is just put in a box behind it or something like that, then it can start to make them less generic, really. But ideally, if we've got our yeah. own images, then it's going to be better. Really. This is a little bit off topic, but what do you know about um, AI images and using those in blogs? Have you come across that yet? <laughs> yeah, I was reading something about that the other day and whether it is something... At the moment, the jury's still out on it. We There doesn't seem to be any definitive thing about whether it will affect ranking. Certainly, I've got a couple of blogs where I've got AI images on them and a couple of sales pages where I've got AI images on them. And it seems to be okay. They don't, you know, they certainly haven't had any penalties coming up in my Google search console, which is one of the tools I use. But yeah, so at the moment, I would say don't overdo it. But it's something that, you know, it they are there. And, and yeah, and it can make it easier sometimes just to just to have something else because it's not not always easy getting brand shoots and things obviously especially if you are just starting out then that can be quite a big expense in the business really one more unrelated question for you before we wrap up but before i ask that question where's the best place for people to connect with you and maybe engage your services as an seo consultant and website consultant where can people find you so yeah probably the best place is through my website so the website successhub.com and on there, I actually have a little SEO report. So if somebody wants to just see how they're doing, so just get started, get some a few ideas on 
whether they are actually ranking for what they think they should be. And if there's anything major that's holding their website back, then they can get a free report through my website. And I always look at all of those reports that, that get run as well. So if I see something on there where you could get a quick win or something that you can easily fix yourself, then I'll just send you a message and let you know because I always like those quick wins. <laughs> that's a really awesome. And then I do have social media. I'm on Instagram, but I don't, I don't really use it very much. I'm, I'm not on socials as much as I should be, as supposedly should be. <laughs> supposedly. Well, you know what? It just means that you're practicing what you preach about SEO. <laughs> so I'm, all, I'm also, I re, I'm a firm believer in the power of referrals. And that, so I would always say to people, referrals first, then think about SEO and <laughs> sort of social from there. I mean, it's all, they all have places in business, really. SEO is not a quick fix. So it's something that the work you do now will start to pay dividends in three, six, 12 months time. Really. So it's a more sustainable way of growing our businesses. Yeah, I love that. I'm all for the more sustainable ways to grow. <laughs> okay, now for my final question. Since most of my audience are bookkeepers and accountants that serve other small businesses, as a small business owner, do you outsource your bookkeeping or do you do it yourself? <laughs> At the moment, I still do it myself. Okay. So as a small business owner, if you were thinking of outsourcing, what would be the most important thing for you to receive as a deliverable or a, a level of service from a bookkeeper? Oh, good question. I think for me, my big hesitation of getting a bookkeeper would be how easy it would be. Like how, because I feel like I still have to organize things a little bit for the bookkeeper. So, I, and I've never had a conversation with a bookkeeper about this, but I kind of feel like how much easier are they going to make my life? So that, that would be my, my kind mm. of question and my hesitation around it really. So. Yeah, we get that a lot from potential clients that are like, I'm already sorting through all this stuff. So if I sign on with you, am I just going to be able to like, let go of everything? And the answer is no, you still have to keep your receipts organized, you still have to answer a few questions, we do our best to use the Google and figure out what certain things are for. But ultimately, <laughs> we're still gonna have questions. So it's not completely hands off. It's kind of like when you hire a house cleaner, you want to declutter and put things away before the cleaners come over so that they can do their best job and not have things in the way. So I kind of relate it to that in a way of like, you still have to keep your stuff organized enough so that when we have questions, we can get in there and do what we need to do quickly. Great answer. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise with our listeners. And make sure if you're listening to this podcast, go listen to Jules' podcast. Can you shout that out, what it's called, in case someone doesn't go to the show notes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my podcast is called The Website Success Show. It's a very new podcast. I'm actually trying to grow it without social media. So I really appreciate a shout out for that here. That's really good, kind of you. Thank you. This week's episode will be episode 14. So it's still very new. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it, actually. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. I love putting on the podcast. That's probably one of the best decisions I've made in my business when it comes to creating content because it's just so much easier than blogging. And then we can repurpose the transcript into a blog and that helps a little bit. Like, <laughs> yeah, so, I recorded yeah. a, an episode last week about why it's so important to create content that you own first. And yeah, podcasts and blogs are the, are the main ones really. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Everybody go check out Joel's podcast and her website. Everything's linked in the show notes. I will try to link all the tools that we talked about as well. And yeah, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you to everyone who helps make this podcast possible. Content and interviews are produced by me, Serena Shu. Our intro and outro music is written and performed by my brother, Ian Gilliam. Editing is also by Ian using his awesome sound engineering skills along with Descript software. Hosting and publishing is by Buzzsprout. And you can check out the show notes for links to all of these amazing resources and resources mentioned in the episode. Be ambitious. 